Uh, some of you might recognize the first speaker because he was a speaker at the last edition of uh, RLSS. And so uh, Herke van Hoof is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Amsterdam. And uh, generally speaking, he's interested in uh, making reinforcement learning more data efficient by leveraging uh, a variety of uh, structural assumptions. Um, and today he's going to talk, uh, he's going to talk about TD methods with uh, functional approximation. And so Herke, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, take a seat. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, temporal difference methods with function approximation. Um, so, right, maybe before we dive into that, and maybe this is super obvious to most of you, but I thought it was important to like start from this kind of motivation of like, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I didn't put a password, so I don't know what it is. Okay. I'll, I'll, we'll let you know as soon as possible. Um, right, so first question is, okay, why do we want to do approximation anyway, right? So uh, I think uh, yesterday with Olivier, you've uh, probably looked at tabular methods, right? So we're building up a table for every state action pair uh, you you learn and store a Q function. Um, uh, Herke, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah? Uh, the, password, the password for the slides is pastanaga. Maybe I can write it on the screen. <laughs> you chose something easy, yeah? Can uh, I write it? I don't know if I can write here. I, I will write it uh, in Slack as well. Does that work? No, well, a little bit clumsy. Thanks. Can you see it? Or lowercase? I don't know if we can make it a little bit bigger. Sorry for interruption. Oh, it went. I don't know what it is. There we go. It's a little bit bigger, so this works at least. Okay. Did we get that? All right. All right. Um, but, uh, oh, now I have to put it back in play. All right. Um, but in many domains, you have uh, a very large uh, number of states, right? And uh, if that number of states gets very big, you might not even be able to store that whole table in memory, so then obviously that's a problem. Or even maybe you can fit it in memory, but just, right, if you have this big table, you have to fill it up uh, with data, essentially, right? And uh, your just your data requirement might get too high, right, before you can kind of independently learn a good value for each of the cells there. Uh, of course, when the state space is continuous, it's especially problematic because then you kind of have infinite possible values for your for your states. Um, so as a couple of uh, um, examples, you have, of course, right, kind of these famous uh, uh, papers from the last couple of years, um, for example, for Atari games, where kind of rate your state is given by the screen, where you can have lots of different pixel values in the screen. Uh, you have the game of Go, where you have, again, millions of possible boards that you can create by having the black and white stones in different places. And then, like in robotics or uh, control, you often have uh, continuous values, like, right, there's this little cart that can drive left and right, and it has a uh, position and a velocity and this kind of things. Uh, and all of these values are continuous, all right? Um, and for all of these um, systems, at least to some extent, you hope that small changes in state uh, don't impact the value or action that you want to decide that much. So you can generalize, right? If you have two very similar screens in a Atari game or you have two very similar velocities in a physical system or something like this, uh, maybe you can get away with like, taking very similar actions in those cases. Um, so essentially, right, we have just two different aims. You want to represent the value function in a in a kind of compact way, right, without having to learn too many different parameters or values, um, but also in a way that allows generalizing an experience to nearby states. And that's, of course, kind of a very similar kind of um, criteria that you have in any kind of supervised learning as well, right? So on the one hand, you could take a very flexible function class, like a huge neural network or something like this, um, but if a function class is too general, you might overfit. Um, and if you have uh, a very inflexible function, like just maybe a linear function or something like this, maybe it's not expressive enough, so you need to find a good balance. Um, no matter what you choose, right, often you will not be able to represent the true value function exactly. So there's, right, because you 
don't want to go all the way to having something extremely flexible. So as soon as you're somewhere in between, you might not be able to um, exactly represent the value function. So you have to find a good approximation. Um, and right, reinforcement learning with function approximation actually has some unexpected subtlety. So you can just open the deep learning toolbox and apply it to RL problems. Uh, but then you'll find that it doesn't always work, like maybe what you would find intuitive. Um, and we'll explore that uh, today. Um, and to start off where maybe some of those uh, subtlety lie, um, we can kind of look at maybe some common misconceptions. So I kind of try to find uh, some papers. Uh, so for example, a paper from a recent ICML uh, where they said uh, DQN minimizes the temporal difference error. Uh, and another paper from RSS where they said uh, Q-learning minimizes the Bellman error. Now, both of these are, are not true, and at the end of today's lecture, uh, you'll know why, and also what the correct statement is. Um, our plan for today is so we'll cover the following topics. Uh, we'll start with function approximation and semi-gradient TD learning, so that's kind of the first uh, algorithm for learning with approximation that typically you see. Um, then we'll kind of see in what kind of problems you end up, so that's this deadly triad. Uh, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into this uh, uh, errors in value function geometry. And finally, we'll look at alternatives to uh, semi-gradient methods, right? So how can we solve those problems? Um, I have to say my own research interest is a little bit different, right? So I'm uh, teaching this as a kind of, let's say, advanced basics uh, course. Uh, I myself usually look more to actor critic methods, hierarchical structures, and so on. Um, yeah, but I'll, of course, uh, try to answer any question you have as well as I can. Uh, the book is, of course, you I guess you all know it. Uh, it's available for free online. So, um, yeah, if you want to, let's say, after the lecture, read up on a little bit more details, then that's also a very good resource to start. Um, so when starting to say, okay, we want to step away from this tabular method, so for every state action pair, we learn a completely separate independent Q function, for example, or value function or whatever. Um, now uh, we will uh, learn parameters of some, val of some uh, value function. So we have basically a function that will now be a function of both the parameters that we choose and uh, the state that we are in. And kind of the most simple way maybe to think about this, like the first example is uh, a state aggregation. So here we group states together and we say rather than having one Q function or value function for each state independently, we are gonna assign the same value to this whole group of states. Um, so right uh, here uh, I showed uh, like some system which has, for example, 200 states. Um, then we could say, okay, we group all of these together where it's blue, all of these together where it's green, and so on. So this gives us kind of a basis, right? And then we can see what kind of functions can we uh, create out of those basis functions. And this would, for, for example, be one value function that we can represent using that basis, right? So you get kind of these kind of functions that stepwise where a whole group of states is kind of, uh, um, yeah, forced to take on the same value. And of course, in reality, the value might not be the same for all of these states. So, um, right, maybe this is an approximation of the true value function. Make sense so far? Right. Don't feel, don't hesitate to ask questions if anything comes up during the lecture. Um, now, you can, of course, make this a little bit more flexible. So rather than just say, right, we have this kind of piecewise constant uh, approximation, we can also go for linear function approximation. In that case, we typically specify some transformation. So we uh, have a couple of functions of the state, features of the state, let's say. So like x1 could be uh, uh, the x-coordinate and x2 the y-coordinate of the agent or something like this. Uh, or it could be like, you know, the color of a specific pixel or whatever. Um, and then, right, for this linear function approximation, we say, okay, we'll approximate the true value function. So there's a little hat for the approximation as just a linear function. Uh, so a some factor of parameters inner producted with that uh, f um, transformation of the state. Of course, we can write it out as a sum as well. Uh, so we'll say, okay, we'll look for the best value function within this function class. Um, so, uh, yeah, one thing to say is that, of course, this value function is linear in W, but not in the state itself, right? Because we can have a nonlinear transformation here. Um, 
And then the question is, of course, how should you choose this transformation, right? This is completely free, so you can uh, pick anything that you like based on the kind of problem and based on like what do I think are important features of this particular problem. Um, if you kind of don't have an a priori feeling of like, oh, right, these are f uh, aspects of the problem that I should represent as one of these functions x, um, you can take some let's say, generic choices. So uh, you can kind of take a polynomial basis, right? So it's the same as polynomial uh, regression. Um, so these functions x1, x2, and so on are just going to be like a linear function and then a square function, then a third power and so on. And you just go as far as you think uh, you'll need or you can try out a couple of different values. Um, you can also go for like a Fourier basis where like, right, maybe this is like uh, a first property of your problem, like the x-coordinate, and that's the y-coordinate, but now I apply a kind of Fourier transformation where you take the sine and cosine of different directions, uh, or I can take radial basis functions where you specify a couple of centers, and then, right, the um, activation of each of those features will just be the uh, based on the distance from those uh, centers. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, you can also pick anything else you like, which is kind of task specific. So if you know, oh, right, in this maze, I have my agent and an enemy, and those two things are really important. Maybe I should include the X and Y position of both of them or something like this. Of course, this function aggregation, what we just saw on the last slide, is a special case of this linear approximation, right? So if I choose this X1, X2, and so on to be... Oh, cannot easily go back, to be these functions, these kind of little uh, 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 step functions that are just on for like, right, wherever we are in that set, uh, then we can represent the value function also in this way. Okay, so those are linear approximations, and of course we can do nonlinear function approximations, so essentially that's everything else. Uh, so this can be, of course, very popularly be chosen as some kind of neural network, like a feed forward, uh, a perceptron structure as here, multi-layer perceptron, or it can be like a, right, an LSTM or a ConfNet or, or whatever you like. Um, and we'll see some advantages and disadvantages uh, uh, later on. Um, we'll mostly focus here beca just because like kind of the theoretical properties are, are more straightforward on the, on the linear case. And we'll already see, right, kind of that that's maybe a much simpler case, but we'll already see that that's maybe not so simple. Um, now, bef yeah, before going into uh, how we can actually learn these type of value functions, let's quickly revisit what we saw before. So I hope this is something you saw with uh, Olivier. Um, so if we just do simple tabular TD0, uh, um, right, we for every state, we maintain uh, a value. Um, and then every time we get a new transition in the environment, uh, we update that value with a learning rate such as this one. So we have a learning rate there. Um, and uh, right here we get some term, uh, which you might know is a TD error. Um, and if you look a little bit closer into this update, you can kind of distinguish two parts. You can say, okay, we have the current value of... Um, uh, at that state according to the learned value function, so it ends up here and here, but then there is like another term here, this r plus gamma times v, um, which is, you could say, that's kind of, we we would like v to be more like that value, so that's like a, a kind of target. Okay. Um, and with a function approximator, basically the intuition is we kind of want a roughly the same thing, um, but now we can't say we'll update the value for this particular state. We have to update uh, uh, the parameters w, which are going to affect the value for many different states. Um, so we still want to kind of uh, go in a direction that this term becomes uh, smaller, closer to zero. Um, but now we do this by multiplying that whole thing by uh, the gradient of uh, of the value function, right? So you can kind of see, of course, what does this gradient indicate? This gradient indicates, like, if I change w, does this value become larger or smaller? So um, if this term is positive, so the um, target is bigger, then we're going to go in the direction that this v that will change w in the direction that this v will get bigger. And if this is negative, so the current v is too uh, uh, large, um, some negative number comes out here, so we have a negative number multiplied by the gradient, so we'll move w in the direction that v gets smaller. Right? So intuitively that makes some sense. Um, 
And, and this is a very popular method, right? Uh, we'll see um, DQN, for example, in, in a lot of detail this afternoon and, and the next talk, and it's kind of based on this type of, uh, of insight. But there's also some, let's say, uh, complaints you could level against this method. So um, uh, the, the first thing is like, it kind of looks like maybe that this is based on the gradient of some error function, um, right? So, you know, maybe this is a kind of inner derivative of, of, of an error term based on the CD error or something like this. But actually, it's it's not a gradient of some, let's say, well-known error term, um, because this uh, TD error has V in two places, right? Or has W in two places. It's both here and here. But in this gradient term, only this last bit shows up. So it doesn't seem to be, a, let's say, a true gradient method. So just to clarify that a little bit, I put in, uh, uh, right, what would that look like if we would take something like, right, the square TD error as a kind of loss function, right, and uh, one half times the square TD error, and it would want to move in a negative gradient of that. Um, well, we can write the gradient of that uh, term, right, so we have the square here, so we just take that whole, the outer derivative is just that whole thing, I just repeat it here, uh, times two, so this uh, 0 0.5 disappears. Um, and then we have to take the inner derivative, right? So which terms here depend on W? Well, that's both this guy here and that guy there. So we have two um, terms ending up in this uh, inner derivative. And we see that up to here, it's the same as this semi-gradient method. But there is this additional term here that doesn't ap appear there, right? And this is the gradient of the target. Okay. Um, so... Right, which is not to say that this would be a good idea as a method to implement, right? So I don't want to argue that, but I just want to say, okay, look, this uh, um, uh, equation there, it's not a, a gradient of the something like the square TD or something like that. Um, and because of that, this method is called the semi-gradient method, right? So it's not, co it's not quite a gradient method. Uh, and what's also important to know, this uh, um, semi-gradient method is not going to min minimize the TD error. So if you look at where this converges, it's not converging to the value of W where the TD error is smallest. Yeah? Uh, super basic question. Why is this not a good update, the one you presented, the actual one for the TD error? Uh, we'll get back to it. Okay. Yeah, a couple Thanks. of slides. There's also a question, I think, here. Okay, the same one, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, there's actually the last point here on the slide, right? Uh, the function doesn't minimize the TD error, but we'll also see that minimizing the TD error is not in general kind of what we want anyway, and that's we'll go into detail of that on that uh, later on. Um, okay, but let's for a moment stick with this uh, learning rule. Uh, right, if we want to implement this as an algorithm, how would that look like? Uh, well, essentially we have all the ingredients right here, right? So we can plug in everything that we know. So we know W, we know R, we know uh, uh, the current, uh, right? We know we have the current weights, uh, so we can evaluate this in that term. The only kind of thing where we need to do a little bit of effort is this gradient of the uh, value function at the current value of the parameters. Um, so. Uh, right, we can do that. Um, for linear function approximation, that term is extremely easy because remember from the earlier slide, if we have a linear function approximation, this V term is just going to be, um, right, this inner product. So we just have the gradient with respect to W of W times X, so that's just X, right? So that's very nice and easy. If, of course, we have some nonlinear function approximation, um, the calculation gets a bit more involved, but we can, like, uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow can take care of that for us, right? So we kind of can can uh, plug that in and ask uh, uh, a kind of backward computation from PyTorch or TensorFlow. Okay. Um, so we can now see for, again, for some very toy example, okay, what type of results do we get out? So, um, Right here, they had a particular system. I think this was just a random walk system. So essentially, you start in state 50, and every uh, step 
randomly you go like one step left or right so you end up going back and forth a little bit and finally you end up at uh, zero you get like minus one reward and if you end up at 101 uh, let's say so if you go out from the system on that side you get a reward of positive one so the true value function is just kind of this uh, this linear slope I don't know if it's quite linear, but almost um, that the further you get to the ends of the chain, right, you, the more you get to the associated reward there. Um, now you can also look at if we now use the semi-gradient uh, TD, um, right, for a function aggregation scenario, where again, just as we uh, said before, uh, we group the states together and we'll force the algorithm to give the same value to this group of states, right? So there's just one weight uh, corresponding to all of these states together, one weight corresponding to those states together, and so on. So rather than learning 100 separate states, we're learning, I think, it's 10 different weights. I don't know why there's this uh, weird gap there. Um, and, um, right, if you observe this graph, right, I mean, of course, one thing is very clear, right? Um, if I'm going to uh, represent my value function with this kind of stepped function, I will not perfectly retrieve the red line, right? So kind of we expect maybe these kind of artifacts uh, where we're gonna be a little bit off at the corners, right? That's fine. But we also see something else, which is that like, it seems that, you know, if I had to fit this kind of stepped uh, line to the red line, I could maybe do a better job than this, right? Like here, it's kind of just too high and all of these could have been a little bit lower and it would have been overall maybe a better fit. Um, so, yeah, this is a property of this type of methods. They don't converge to the solution that's, in a sense, closest to the true value function. Um, so that maybe that surprises a little bit, and um, it raises some question, like, actually, does this always converge? And uh, can I characterize the type of solution that it's converging to? Um, and that's something that I want to look into with you a little bit. Um, so let's directly dive into that question of what does it converge to? So we can, for the linear uh, value function approximation, um, we can look at that theoretically quite easily. So we can say, okay, right, we have these uh, um, yeah, recursive updates where every time the new weight is, right, this type of function of the old weight. And how do we see this as linear function approximation? Well, remember here at the end, we had the gradient of V, um, and we said, okay, this gradient of V in the linear function approximation case is just X, right? Um, and what we want to know now is, right, if I'm just running this update over and over and over again, at which point um, is the expected new value the same as the old value? Because at that point we have converged, right? If on expectation uh, we are not going to change this W any further. Okay, so I kind of go and rewrite it a little bit. Uh, so essentially I just pulled this X inside over here, and then I kind of can factor out, um, where we go? Oh yeah, sorry. And I've also pulled this W out, right? Um, so now we want, so this is just the TD update, right? So even if we're kind of at convergence, um, if we keep doing this update, we will see it kind of jumping around a little bit because the transitions are stochastic. Right, so we wonder about okay, what's the expected uh, update going to be? So it's the expected value of the new weights given the old weights. Um, okay, so we also take the expected value of the right hand side. Uh, I pulled it in as close as possible to the uh, um, random variables. So we see okay, on expectation, the new weight is going to be the old weight plus alpha times this factor here, which I'll call b. This matrix here, which I'll call A, times the old weights, right? Does this make sense? Yeah? Um, yeah, so good question. So this is following the kind of the convention of the uh, Sutton and Bartow book, which is, I mean, it has, a, 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 so there's different conventions in RL which is sometimes used. So essentially in every, uh, time step, the start of the time step is, uh, is for example, xt. So we'll have xt, then we'll take an action at, then we'll get reward, which is then called rt plus 1, and we'll get uh, the new state, which is xt plus 1. So rt plus 1 is, let's say, the reward you observe just before, let's say, transitioning to this state. Um, 
And because at every transition, we also update the weight factor, right, in this uh, um, yeah, normal Q learning or TD learning approach, um, the, the Ws are indexed by the same T. So when we are at step 100 of the uh, episode, uh, we will both at like, we will be at X 100, but we'll also have the um, 100 update to W. Of course, if you're kind of in a different learning paradigm where you kind of batch updates or you do experience replay or something like this, maybe it doesn't, right? Maybe you'll, you won't have the same uh, indexes for the two. Um, okay, and we want to know now essentially, right, when is uh, this whole thing going to be the same as W, right? So when is the new value of W going to be equal to the old value of W, because at that point we've converged. Um, and when we are at that point, we'll call that point uh, WTD. Now with a little bit of linear algebra, right, if you just kind of solve this equation, so you want to have here WT equals, and then that whole thing. So you see this is just a linear equation where we have WT appearing and otherwise a bunch of constants, right? So that's very easy to solve. So we just get that this WTD um, is just going to be equal to this A matrix inverse times B, okay? We can do the do the math. Uh, it's also in the in the Sutton and Barto book. I didn't want to go through it here, but it's it's not very complicated. Um, so um, so at so we now know there is a point which is called WTD, which we can just if we know the expectation of these values, which of course for a unknown system, if I just drop you in an Atari game, you won't know these things. But for a simple system, if you have the knowledge of like what are the transition probabilities and and so on, you can calculate cal calculate those, and that's uh, that's where TD is supposed to converge to, and. Um, we won't do any proofs, but I'll just tell you that uh, on policy semi-gradient TD, so semi-gradient TD is the algorithm we talked about, right, that one. And uh, uh, on policy just means that we are trying to learn the value function belonging to the policy that is also um, picking the actions currently, so it's also the behavior policy. Um, if we do that with independent linear features, we are guaranteed to converge to that fixed point, so to this TD fixed point. So that's somehow kind of, let's say, a special point that semi-gradient TD converges to. Now I can kind of very quickly also introduce you to another algorithm. Um, so we could also try to f find the same fixed point by trying to learn this matrix A and learn this matrix, uh, this factor B. So just every time we have a transition, we can calculate for that particular transition, we can calculate this term and this term, we average those out over um, right, all of the time steps that we have. So this expectation just becomes an empirical average. Then we just do this computation. That's another way to try to calculate those fixed points. So that's called LSTD, least squares temporal difference. So that's just, um, yeah, it's maybe interesting to know. Um, right. So um, now, um, uh, so far we looked at learning the V function, right? Um, and I guess you have covered it already yesterday. Uh, yeah, you can of course typically either learn a V function or you can learn a Q function. Uh, if you only want to know how good is a particular state, V function is fine, but if you also want to uh, be able to control, so be able to pick the optimal action, um, then uh, learning Q is easier, right? Because if you learn the Q function, you can look at, okay, I am in this state, now I can plug in all the possible actions I can take, um, and then I take the action where this Q function is maximal. Um, and you can essentially do exactly the same um, uh, kind of update that we talked about for the value function, so the semi-gradient update, you can do exactly the same thing for Q. So I wrote it down here, but there isn't really any any specific surprises in there, just everywhere we used to have a V, we just put in uh, the Q function. So this is, let's say, a SARSA-like method, right? Where the update also depends not only on the AT, so the action we're about to choose now, but also the action we're gonna choose in the next time step. Um, now this is um, um, uh, the 
equation you can use for episodic task. If you want to do a continuing task, then you actually need a small uh, modification. Don't want to go into that uh, now, but that's also in the uh, in the Sotnabarto book. Um, so how could we um, write a algorithm for learning control, right? So for obtaining the optimal policy, well, it would look something like this. Uh, we have a current policy pi. Um, we select an action according to that policy. Then we use this equation to uh, improve the estimate of q pi. Um, and then we improve pi. So, right, then we improve the policy to be a soft approximation of the greedy policy. So, right, for example, something like an epsilon greedy policy of that q uh, function we are um, estimating. We can look at that maybe in uh, in algorithm form. So also the right take it from the Sato and Barto book. Um, so right, we start with some uh, value function parameterization. So I have to choose the function class. Um, I have to choose the step size. I have to choose some convergence criterion, um, and I can initialize the uh, weights of the. Uh, Q function, so the state action value function, arbitrarily, we can make it start at zero, we can start at some random value, it doesn't really matter. Um, then you're going to uh, right, um, generate episodes in your world. In the episode, you start with some random uh, state and action pair, so S is typically given by the world, A could be chosen by epsilon greedy, for example, um, and then every step of the episode um, we'll execute that action in the world, we'll observe the reward and the next state. Well, if the next state is terminal, we immediately um, uh, execute the update function and go to the next episode. So what's important here in this case, there's no queue of the next state, right? Because we've just terminated. Um, if S prime was not terminal, then We'll, and this is like a little bit special if you're implementing something Sarsa-like, you already have to commit to the next action you're going to execute because you need it in your update function. So we already pick the A prime, so the action we're gonna execute in the next time step. And this can be done, for example, also um, in, the, in this epsilon greedy manner. Then we execute the uh, semi-gradient update. And then we kind of write, we just do some bookkeeping. We set the state and the action current state and action to this S prime and A prime that we have already committed to. And then in the next iteration of the loop, the next thing we're going to do is actually uh, execute that action in the world. Um, yeah, so what's important here, right? I said here, oh, there's a step. Uh, we want to improve the uh, policy to, a, to uh, set it to a soft approximation of the greedy policy under that Q function we're learning. You don't really see that step explicitly in this algorithm. But of course, where I'm choosing A as a function of the current Q function, and I uh, select that from the epsilon greedy policy of Q, kind of implicitly you could say every time, right, you're kind of um, uh, selecting a policy which is the epsilon greedy policy under that Q function. It's just kind of hidden within that action selection step. Okay. Um, right. So far, so good. Okay. Um, this was all on policy, right? So the uh, policy used to select actions is the same policy that I'm updating. Um, but right, as you might already know, like kind of off policy is usually very important, right? Because maybe you want to have uh, a take explorative actions in the real world, but the policy you want to obtain is like the optimal policy, so an op policy that doesn't take exploration actions. Or maybe you have actions that were generated according to a policy that you already knew before, um, and you are not really free to like uh, do exploration in the world now, so you kind of need to learn offline. Um, so then we have this problem uh, that, um, right, the algorithm kind of assumes that it gets uh, transitions generated according to the policy, but now it's gonna actually get transitions generated by some other policy than the behavior policy. Um, or, sorry, than the target policy. Yeah. Um, and to correct for that, for that difference, we're gonna always have these uh, importance weights. 
So these importance weights have, these, have this uh, fraction in there, which is uh, the fraction of the target policy to the behavior policy. So what this is going to do, um, it's going to, if I have an action that's, for example, going to be taken uh, very frequently by the behavior policy, but it would be taken very seldomly by the target policy, then this uh, weight is going to be uh, very small, right? It's going to be smaller than one. So uh, this we are getting this sample more often than we should get, so we kind of correct for that by giving it a low weight. And vice versa, if there's an action that this behavior policy would rarely take, but actually the target policy would take it a lot, uh, every time we do run into one of those samples, we have to give it a high weight to kind of com again compensate for that. Um, so in principle, we can correct uh, these type of updates just by plugging that importance weight right uh, in right after the uh, right after the learning rate. So essentially, you could say you make the learning rate a bit higher, so you make a bigger step whenever you get one of those samples that are actually a little bit too rare. Um, so we can see how this type of method uh, behaves, right? So um, I draw, drew here a little system. So the system is very simple. There's two states. My function approximator, so linear function approximator, it work, works as follows. Um, I have some weight, I set it maybe to 10 at the beginning. Um, in this state, right, I just have uh, set a value of uh, W, and in that state I set a value of 2 times W. The policy is just that whenever I'm here I go there, whenever I dare I go here, um, and I never get any reward. So logically the only value function that's consistent with that system is the value function that gives zero value everywhere, right? So uh, because they need to be obviously the same in the two, and any w that's not zero, I would have different values there and there. So if I set it to w, what we'd want is the value to slowly get lower as I'm learning. So what will now happen? Well, if I make a transition from left to right, so I have this, uh, uh, the value at the state where I'm coming from is w, uh, my target value will be two times w. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just setting the, discount function to be a one, just to make it simple, right? So if I just uh, fill in that semi-gradient learning rule that we had, right, I'll get that the new weight is going to be the old weight, plus, and then there is, right, this uh, this CD error and the gradient of the value function, so I can also uh, fill all of that in. Um, and we see well, I could also have put a 10 in, but what we see is like we're going to make this W actually a little bit bigger, right? Because this is going to be a positive number. This is going to be positive 1 times W, and W was also a positive number. So if we go from W to, to, to W, we'll get a target of 2W, so we'll make this W a little bit higher. So it's going to be going a bit in the wrong direction, actually. But then when we go from two, but equally often as we go from here to here, we go again from here back to there, right? So what happens if we go back? Well, it's exactly the opposite. The current value is at, is two uh, w, and the target value is w. So we'll get w minus two w times the gradient of the value function where we are. The gradient of two w is just two, right? So we'll get a value here, which is exactly the negative of what we had before, but now it's multiplied by 2. So uh, whenever we have this transition, we make w a little bit higher, but whenever we go back, we actually make it uh, uh, lower by a bigger step. So on expectation, we go down, which is exactly what we want to bring this w down to 0. Right? So um, this temporal difference error on efforts tend to shrink, so that's very, very good. Right? That, that's doing exactly what we want. But this was on policy. So now let's see what happens in the off policy case. So now let's say the behavior policy is going back and forth, but the target policy, the one that we actually want to learn the Q function of, is uh, is going to stay in that second state. Um, so whenever we go from left to right, it's exactly the same as before. Uh, right? We get this uh, um, semi-gradient rule. Um, but now there is this extra... Um, importance uh, weight here. But since from left to right, the behavior policy and the target policy are the same, both policies go from left to right, so that... Uh, um, uh, importance weight is just going to be about 1. So exactly the same thing happens as before, the W is going to get a little bit higher. But now what happens if we're for these transitions where we go, right, under behavior policy, we go back from right to left, 
uh, well, we have the same thing as here, but with this importance weight. But now this importance weight is going to be uh, zero, right? Because the behavior goes with probability one to the left, but the target goes with probability one. It stays there, so it doesn't actually take that action. So we have to correct for that. Um, and so we go we take that little step which goes in the wrong direction, but we never correct for that to go in the right direction. So this is, of course, a little bit... Uh, rough example, right? So it isn't quite correct because, for example, these importance weights uh, don't actually work if what the target uh, policy does, if it has zero probability under the behavior policy. I mean, no matter what you do, you can't correct for that. Um, so this example is not 100% valid, but it kind of starts raising a question, which is uh, when we have these uh, importance weights, which are much, much smaller to, uh, than one, um, maybe the TD error can keep increasing indefinitely. It doesn't go down as we as we actually like, right? Um, so this is a, a bit more to build intuition, but now to give, let's say, a completely correct example, uh, we can look at uh, at the uh, Baird's counter example from the from the book, which is constructed in a little bit more complicated way. I will not uh, uh, walk through all the details. Um, but what we can see if we look at how do the weights in this example evolve, we can actually see what's happening. This is clearly not converging, right? These things uh, actually, um, yeah, start changing more and more actually as we are learning more, right? So this is just the amount of learning steps and this is just the size of the weights, right? The value of those weights and they just kind of seem to kind of be on a kind of uh, exponential trajectory, let's say. Um, Right. Now, you could ask a couple of questions about this counter example, right? So why is that? Why uh, do these errors keep getting bigger and bigger? Maybe it has to do that the true value is not exactly representable, right? So we have a uh, class, uh, function class for the function approximation, and maybe this problem arises because uh, that class doesn't contain the true value. Well, that's actually not the case, because I can make this example a little bit richer and make sure that the, even the true fee is representable and we don't find it. Um, maybe it's due to random effects. Well, that can also be excluded, because there's also deterministic versions of this uh, example where, uh, where still we're, we are diverging. Well, and the last thing you could say, maybe it has to do with uh, dependent features, right? Like... Um, uh, the value here and the value there, they are both re rely on this uh, uh, W8 weight, so maybe that's to blame. Well, actually, you can also exclude it. So, um, right, then, <laughs> right, so then what, essentially, right? And, um, yeah, uh, in the past, uh, people have done a lot of work to kind of try to drill down, and in the end, um, the um, conclusion is that uh, this divergence occurs if you have three factors that kind of all come together. So you have function approximation, um, you have semi-gradient bootstrapping, so the semi-gradient method that we've been talking about so far, and you have uh, off-policy training, right? So as, as soon as you have those three together, you can't guarantee um, that your um, yeah, learning process is going to converge anymore. Um, and yeah, that's not something that's very easily solved. So maybe the first um, uh, question you could ask is, could we do without any one of those three ingredients, right? So, um, well, let's, let's look at all of them. Can we get rid of this function approximation? Well, at the start of this lecture, we said um, this function approximation is actually very important, right? We often have, like, too many states uh, to uh, practically be able to learn each of those states independently. Um, and without function approximation, we cannot scale to large or continuous uh, domains, so domains with a large or continuous state space. Um, we could also say, well, let's get rid of bootstrapping, right? So I guess that yesterday Olivier has probably talked also about, right, we have TD methods like Q-learning and SARSA and so on that learn from single transitions, and we have Monte Carlo methods that learn from an entire rollout, right? So I look from a certain state, what's the whole future until the end of an episode. Um, but those methods, they don't have this problem, this divergence problem, but they tend to be much, much slower to learn. So we kind of don't want to, you know, we don't want to get, get back to them. Um, 
And uh, then we can ask, okay, right, then maybe this off-policy learning is problematic, maybe we have to get rid of it. And, you know, we, we, we could, we can just say, well, we'll just always learn the policy, uh, we'll lear always learn the Q function of the current behavior policy that we're looking at. Um, but it's not quite what we want, right? So um, I, if you look, if you kind of think a little bit kind of to the future, maybe what you'd like to do is learn all kinds of tasks, right? Like you have a robot and you want the robot to be able to run and to walk and to stand. Um, and ideally, while let's say the robot is trying to run and it kind of learns something about balance or it learns something about like, I don't know, collisions with, with walls or something like this, that's also valuable experience for when it's trying to walk or to jump or to stand, let's say. Um, so if you can learn off policy, you can take the data while the running policy is active and use the same data to learn to walk, for example. Um, and with off policy learning, you can also do other things, right? So let's say I have recorded data. So for example, from uh, someone uh, piloting the robot with a joystick or something like this, or maybe I have old data, so data generated by a very old policy, I can maybe can get something out of it. Or maybe, right, I have some, let's say safety critical situation where I have a controller that's been, um, yeah, that's been thoroughly vetted, that people say, okay, this has been working for 10 years, there haven't been any problems, so we are we are comfortable with that. We have generated millions of data points using this old controller. Can you now use reinforcement learning to give us a new controller? Um, but before you apply that new policy to the, to the safety critical system, we want to first be able to vet it, right? We want to first be able to make sure that this is really doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so you only have this old data to learn from that's generated by a different policy uh, and you can't do exploration with your new policy that you're learning. So in all of those cases, yeah, you do really want to have a policy that can handle off-policy data, so that can handle data coming from any of these sources and use that to learn a new optimal policy. Right, um, any questions so far? I have a question over there. Uh, hello, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know if you still have this problem if you go from model free to model based era. Because in my mind, if your behavior policy has a positive probability of sampling every state action pair, you don't have this problem uh, in model based methods. But uh, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> thinking about that uh, in model base so I guess like if you you have kind of a lot of different model based methods right so some model based methods like learn a model and then you kind of train your policy on that model let's say right so the model is just like a proxy for real interaction with the system then nothing really changes right so instead of having the real system we have that simulated system um, but right this is also a simulated system and things go wrong, right? So that could also happen with a learned model. Uh, I guess one, but it kind of really depends on a lot of detail. You could also say, well, right, in that model, I can now do a look at a lot of on policy, uh, we do a lot of, get a lot of on policy experience, right? So, uh, well, then if you're on policy, this is not a problem, right? Whereas on the real system, you might say, it's on the real system, it's much more critical to minimize the amount of interaction I have with the system. So I want to get the maximum out of all data that they have lying around, right? So I really want to be off policy. Um, so in that sense, you could kind of maybe get around it by just saying, well, if, if I have a model and I can get infinite data anyway, um, uh, I can get as much on policy data as I want. Why would I even want to do off policy? Yeah. But it depends because there's also other, right? They think like learning a model and then just using a model free technique on the learned model as if it were the real system is just one approach within the model based kind of toolkit. Um, and for other methods, I'm not exactly sure how much this would apply or not. No. All right. Okay. So. Right, so we said, okay, we have this uh, problem when those two things, when those three things come together, uh, we can have possible divergence. 
Um, and it's not so easy to just take three of those things out, right? Or at least it doesn't seem to be a path towards, um, let's say, having reinforcement learning work at scale in applications we care about. Um, so maybe, right, we have to just, maybe we can do bootstrapping, but just get away from this particular semi-gradient method that seems to be maybe a little bit problematic, let's say, right? Um, so maybe you have to kind of take a step back and said, right, at the beginning of this lecture, I said, uh, well, we have um, tabular methods that go in the direction of uh, minimizing the TD error, and we can kind of throw in the gradient of the current value function, and then we get something that we call this gradient method. Um, maybe we can take a step back and think, well, what error function do we actually want to minimize, and can we then define, a, let's say, a more robust algorithm to actually minimize that error, right? Right. Um, so this semi-gradient uh, TD method uh, might differ to an off-policy setting, and right, we already said, okay, this is not really a gradient method, right? And if we have like gradient descent methods, those typically come with a lot of, um, let's say, uh, 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 guarantees. Um, so maybe if we kind of can find a nice loss function and then define a true gradient method on it, maybe that will be more um, uh, stable or more, uh, we can guarantee maybe that it converges in a wider range of settings. Um, and now we have the problem then of saying, okay, but what error shall we actually uh, minimize, right? So, um, yeah, if you know a little bit about reinforcement learning, you know it can kind of quite quickly get confu confusing. You have this TD error, you have the Bellman error, and you have like a bunch of other things. Uh, you can define something called the value error. Um, so what should we actually take, right? And those things tend to like maybe be a little bit similar to each other, right? So um, we have the TD error, which is the one we have maybe seen a lot, right? Which is just um, for a single transition, it's just okay. How, what is the difference between the current estimate of the value and this type of bootstrapping target, right? Um, so what we can define as a potential loss function is the uh, what we call the mean square TD error. So we denote it as TDE for TD error with a bar above it which indicates this kind of, let's say, mean TD error, right? So what you do is like you have this TD error in every time step. This TD error is always squared, right? And then you take the expectation of it, expectation over all actions, and then you take another expectation over states, and of course you, for that you have to choose a state distribution, right? Uh, so some measure on the states. And what we tend to find a useful measure is uh, this visitation distribution. So uh, we take a distribution over states, which is just like, if at a random point when the policy is interacting with the world, I kind of look, what state are you in right now? Um, what's the distribution of states that I would get? Uh, that's this mu. Um, okay, so that's one possibility. You can also look at the mean square Bellman error. So the Bellman error, and so and this, this difference is a bit subtle, but the Bellman error is the expected TD error over all possible uh, uh, outcomes. So, uh, right, so if I take the uh, expectation of the TD error over all uh, um, actions and next states, and then I square the whole thing, right? And then I take the average, then what do I get, right? Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll also see an example later on where maybe the, the, the difference is, is more clear, but mathematically the difference is really whether the square is inside the expectation or outside the expectation. Um, there's another thing called the uh, uh, mean square projected Bellman error, where we say, okay, um, this Bellman error says essentially, um, right, what the difference is between the expected target and my current value. Um, but mainly, maybe the important thing is, um, maybe that target value, maybe that's not even, a pro uh, maybe that's not even representable by my function approximator, by let's say my linear function that I'm trying to fit. So maybe, right, there isn't any point where that's zero, for example, in the uh, value functions that are representable. So what if we only look at the component of that loss that is actually in the space of functions that I can represent? So then we get something called the mean square projected Bellman error, 
where I now put in this uh, pi, which is this projection operator that takes the error and kind of projects it down to the plane of functions that are representable. I have a um, visualization later on that hopefully makes it also a little bit more clear. Anyway, what's important at this point is it's not quite obvious which error function we should take or even maybe how these errors relate to each other. Um, so to kind of make that a little bit more intuitive, um, I uh, uh, drew the following little example. So let's say we have a tiny little system with only three states, right? So how can you look at the space of all possible value functions? Well, for any possible value function that I could imagine, I have one value assigned to the first state, one value assigned to the second state, and then one value assigned to the third state. So you can think of any value function can be represented as a point somewhere in this 3D space, right? Where the x's are exactly those three values that they have to assign. Now, if we have function approximation, we say, okay, right? Maybe we are, we are, we are not free to choose any point in this three-dimensional space. Maybe I just have two uh, parameters that I can choose, right? The W1 and the W2, and those are going to be multiplied with some um, uh, features that I've defined on the state. So maybe my features are, if I am in S1, my features are like 1, 0 for this two. I have two features. So S1 is like 1, 0. S2 is like minus 0 0.5, comma 0. And S3 is 0, comma 1, for example, right? Um, so uh, now what are all value functions that I can represent. Well, th that's all value functions that I can represent are the um, uh, span covered by these uh, by these two factors, right? One minus zero point five zero and zero zero one. So I can draw that, right? Those are these two axes, right? So W one is going to be multiplied by this factor, and W two is going to be multiplied by that factor. Um, so these factors span a 2D subspace, right? So you have to kind of interpret the picture a little bit three-dimensionally, where these S1, S2, and S3, V of S1, S2, and S3 span a 3D space, and this uh, blue uh, plane is kind of a diagonal plane uh, uh, in that 3D space, right? So any value function that's in the blue plane, that's something that they can represent exactly, and any other value function in the 3D space, I cannot represent exactly, right? I have to approximate it. And some of them are well approximable, some of them are very close to something I can approximate, and some are very far. Does this picture make sense? It's gonna get a bit more complicated, so if this is doesn't make sense, then please. Uh, okay. Um, so now we can look at uh, uh, a bit more complicated figure, but it's kind of based on the same principles that we had before. Um, and this figure comes from the Sutton and Barto book. Um, so here you have to still imagine that the 3D space, right? That, that this is a 3D plot, um, which contains all the possible value functions. And now the uh, two fact the two factors spanning the representable subspace are kind of the ground plane of the 3D thing, right? So the plane that was diagonal before, we kind of tilted it and it's now uh, the ground plane. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, there's something wrong on the slide, but I guess you can fill that in. Um, right, so First of all, we can think of, if we are not bound to, um, let's say, our class of function approximations, right? If we just do tabular learning um, based on like normal Q learning, where we don't do any approximation, then what, do, what, do, what does learning look like, right? So uh, we can look at from a certain point, right? So I have a certain value function. What happens if I look at the Bellman error factor, right? So the Bellman error factor points somewhere, we can denote it as the Bellman operator times that old value function. Then we end up at a new point in space. Um, and this Bellman error fac factor, uh, right, we saw before this Bellman error is actually uh, the average of TD errors. So if you end up, if you do something like um, TD zero or something like this, on average, you go in this direction. On expectation, you go in this direction. So of course, one time you go a bit more here, one time you go a bit more there, but you end up averaging going there. Um, and then if you keep doing that, you end up here, 
which is a true value function, right? So if you don't have any approximation, if you do like TD, TD0 or something like this, um, you end up at VPi, right? So that's that's the ideal place where you could end up. Um, and if you do, of course, also something like uh, dynamic programming, right, then you kind of take exactly always these steps in the direction of the Bellman error. So, right, if you do dynamic programming, you really follow this path. If you do um, TD0 or something like this, you kind of stochastically go, let's say, a little bit around this path, but you also end up there, converging to there. Um, oh. Um, right, now we are approximating, so we don't have a chance to go here, right? So everything we can do when we are approximating is stay in this 2D plane at the bottom. So first question we can ask without wor worrying about learning dynamics is what's the closest point in that 2D uh, plane um, to that ideal value function? So, right, we can just project it right down, right? We can do linear predictions since we're kind of a linear setting um, and uh, uh, project down. So then we have a point here in the 2D space, some point which is a minimum value error. So it means the distance between this point and uh, um, yeah, the true value function is smallest. We make the least, the, least, uh, the least difference in values that we assign to the different states, right? So that could be one possibility of something that we want to go for. Um, but, Right, of course, we can't do that. We can't do the learning in the unrestricted space because we're approximating, right? So we cannot even represent this point here, right? Because this point is not in the representable subspace. Um, so trying to find this point and then projecting it down, that's not something uh, that we can do algorithmically, right? So we have to uh, uh, do something a little bit different. So what could we do instead? Well, I already in the last slide introduced a couple of different error measures that are based more on like TD concepts, right? That are based on the difference between uh, where am I now and where am I uh, and, and where did they end up after the transition. Um, so what we could do is we could look at which point in this representable subspace has the smallest Bellman error, for example. Um, there's not generally a point where the Bellman error is zero, not necessarily, um, but there is some point where the Bellman error is smallest, and actually that's not the same as that point with the minimum value error. So it could be that at the minimum value error in general, there could be still a quite large Bellman error, and maybe there's some other point where that's smaller. So the point where the er Bellman error is minimum is typically different to the point where this value error is minimum. Um, right. If we now, uh, yeah, this I actually talked about that. Um, so maybe we have to um, update according to the Bellman error, right? So uh, we could say, okay, we want to uh, g go in the direction of this Bellman error factor, the same thing that we did uh, when we were doing like TD0 in the tabular case, but Right? I cannot actually represent this point. So after, at the end of one step, what should I do? Well, maybe at the end of every step separately, I have to project down into this representable subspace. So maybe the step that I should take is this one here. This is like the projected Bellman error. So maybe I should try to kind of go in that direction, right? And then in the next step, I would do the same, right? In the next step, I would still again look at like, what's my Bellman error factor, project it down, and then I would go in that direction, right? And I would kind of continue learning like that, where at the end of every step, I'm still in this representable subspace. Um, what do I mean exactly actually when I say projecting down? Uh, well, it's kind of finding the closest alternative to a desired update, and then when you say closest, you always have to define what do you exactly mean, right? So the norm that we use to define closeness is uh, also the norm under that visitation frequency that we had before. I mean, if that doesn't mean so, so much to you, it doesn't really matter, then this kind of notion of we find the closest is, uh, is good enough. Um, so we can wonder, okay, if we always go in the direction of the projected Bellman error, then do we actually end up at that point that we talked about before, that point where the, where the Bellman error is minimum? So we can kind of look what happens, and actually something else happens. So actually there is some point where the projected Bellman error is zero. So essentially if we look at what's the Bellman error at this point, those are always the blue arrows, it's kind of pointing straight up. And then when we project down, we land exactly in the same point that we came from. So we have a point where the projected Bellman error is uh, zero. 
it actually is a point we already know. I kind of drew too much on top of it, but behind there it says WTD, so it says TD fixed point. So that was the point, like, if semi-gradient converges, so if we are if we have linearly independent features and we are on policy, then we actually found that find that point, and LSTD also found that point. Um, so that's a point we already know, and actually that point in general is different from the point where the Bellman error is smallest. So we have some point where the value error is smallest, we have some point where the Bellman error is smallest, and then we have this point where the projected Bellman error is smallest and it's zero actually, um, which is the TD fix point that we already knew. And then, just to make the picture maximally confusing, we can also think of where is the TD, the average TD error lowest. Um, it's generally another point. None of these four, in general, uh, coincide. Um, I mean, the question is kind of what the right one is, right? If we are, um, anytime we're approximating, we have to accept that maybe, you know, we can't, we can't find that one. Right, so that the true value is not in that subspace. Yeah, I think whenever your uh, your um, space is such that this optimal value function is in your space, then all what is it four of them coincide in one point. Um, and that would be the ideal space, right? But if we knew beforehand what the ideal space was, yeah, then we wouldn't have this uh, this conversation, let's say, right? So whenever this guy is not in that space, then we have these uh, different uh, um, solution concepts. Yeah. Have another question there in the back. Uh, yes. Uh, can you go back one slide, maybe? Yes. Uh, one more. Yes, exactly. So. You consider this distant function uh, in the left, but then I'm wondering the, the visitation measure uh, with respect to what policy do you mean? Oh, everything is with respect to. I mean, this is all um, this is all on policy, so it's always the uh, behavior policy. Okay, but and and the values you look at at are are of the of the learned policy, right? So. Because if they weren't, then you were looking at the, the measure of the policy where you look at the values and then kind of your distance function depends on where you are in the space, which would be quite bad, I guess. Uh, so we're looking at, um, yeah, so here you just put a difference between the value functions, right? So if yeah. you want to know how far is this guy from this guy, that's something that depends on uh, the visitation frequencies, which depend on the, the policy is always the same. Wherever you are in the space, this whole space, the policy is the same. Only the value function is different. We are not updating the policy. We're only doing yes, policy exactly. evaluation. Okay. Um, the policy is always the same, and the the distance measure always depends on this visitation frequency, which depends on the policy. And then we have something that depends on the difference between, like for example, this value function and that value function. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thanks. The far back. Thank you. Uh, so I had another question about the visitation frequency. Yep. As I sort of understood it, it's the uh, stationary distribution of the Markov chain induced by the behavior policy, right? Uh, if you are looking at uh, infinite horizon, it's the uh, stationary distribution. Yeah. If you're looking at episodic settings, right, then you don't yeah. really have that concept of yeah. stationary distribution because you always go back to some starting yeah. state distribution yeah. and that influences. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, of course, uh, so I uh, suppose like even in the infinite horizon setting, right? So if you had the transition model, you could of course calculate it easily, right? From a matrix operation. But like in the on policy setting, like is there any pathological case where this, you can't actually, actually find this distance function because the Markov chain doesn't really mix, you can't get it from the samples or? Is it like you can always find an estimate? That's good enough. Um, yeah, so I think uh, there's two uh, two remarks on that. The one is, um, so we need this concept of visitation frequency for the analysis, for kind of thinking about, you know, what is what are these methods going to converge to? It's not necessarily 
that also in the final algorithm that you propose, you're going to have this concept of visitation frequency, right? Like if I do uh, if I do the semi gradient TD, which is what we are kind of also analyzing here, um, there is no visitation frequency in the update, right? But of course, if you kind of want to understand where does this converge, if we keep following it, well, the states where you, or the state action state pairs where you execute that update rule, those are governed by the stationary distribution. Right, so that's how it comes in, but it doesn't come in explicitly. So you don't need to actually know it to be able to run the algorithm. Um, so that's one. Two is, uh, so essentially you never need to really approximate it, right? It's just kind of a theoretical concept that it should exist. Um, it doesn't always exist either, because for example, if I have, uh, um, I forgot the technical term, but you could have like an MDP, which is for example disconnected. So you could have a bunch of states where you can go from one to the other, and another bunch of states that you can go from one to the other, but you cannot go between these two sets, for example, right? And then uh, the visitation frequency that I, the sort of states that I end up visiting, depend on whether I'm initialized in the one set or in the other set. So there are MDPs where this concept of stationary distribution or uh, visitation frequency is not well defined. Yes, yeah. of course, like when the Markov chain is not a good. But yeah, like so I was thinking about this update according to Bellman error. So like that's not really implementable because of this, because for the projection you'd need the visitation frequency, and that. Okay. That's right. So we could try to, right? So, I mean, the question is still whether that's what we want to do. But um, if you'd wanted to uh, come up with an algorithm that's based on following the projected Bellman error, you wouldn't probably get something that exactly goes in the direction of the projected Bellman error, but go in the direction of some stochastic approximation of it. Just like if we're doing tabular TD0, we don't go exactly in this our direction of the Bellman error factor, but we go in the direction of this, uh, um, yeah, like a stochastic approximation of it, which like, right, sometimes it goes a bit more this direction, sometimes it goes a bit in that direction, but if you look at what's the expected direction of the update, that the Bellman error factor is the uh, expected direction. So in that sense, we could maybe come up with something, yeah. Um, all right. Let me see how am I doing on time. Get down to speed up a little bit. All right. So uh, we were here, right? We had all these different type of errors that we could try to uh, minimize. Um, and kind of they all sound reasonable, right? Like, okay, why not minimize the TD error or something like this? Um, but, right, we kind of have to choose because they're all different. So, right, kind of which one should we choose? So maybe we should just kind of look one by one to see, well, is this actually a good... Um, error to be minimizing. Um, so we can start with the TD error, which I already said before, well, right, you could maybe change that semi-gradient to TD to be a true gradient of the TD error, but is it really something that you would want, right? So we can look at a very simple example, again taken from the Zambarto book, um, uh, to see maybe what kind of problems there could exist, right? So if you look at this uh, little uh, system, so with three states, A, B, and C, you have the rewards that are kind of written on the arrows here. Um, and the policy here is 50-50 uh, between top and down. Um, so, right, if you kind of think about it, uh, if you kind of think about it as a kind of symmetrical argument, right, like from A, in the end, I have equal chance to go to B and C. From B, I always get one. From C, I always get zero. Um, so what value kind of intuitively do you think would minimize the TD error at A? Zero point five, yeah, excellent. Um, so okay, let's fix a to be zero point five uh, by symmetry, and then we can think of okay, what value should we assign? For example, at b, right? So at b, you could assign the value of one. Then you have an error here, which is one, and then you have an error here. Or sorry, an error here, which is zero, right? Because you have a have a value here of one, and the td and the td target will also be one. So one minus one is zero. But you have an error here, right? So on the transition of A to B, I come from 0 0.5 and I go to uh, 1. So I have an error of 0 0.5 or a square error of a quarter, right? Um, you can probably do a little bit better, right? Because you're going to be squaring that error and you're going to be squaring that error. So, um, and I can shift. If I shift B a little bit downwards, this guy goes up a little bit, that guy goes down a little bit. Be because I'm squaring, I'd like B to be exactly in the middle, right? So I'd like B to be uh, three quarters. Right, then the TD error, and then the same 
C, I like to be at one quarter. Then all the TD errors of all these four transitions together are going to be minimal, right? Um, and um, maybe that's not what we want, right? If we just look at B, if we look, it doesn't matter how we got to B, what's going to happen after? Well, from B, we're always going to get a reward of one, right? So the only value that we would really be uh, happy with to assign to B will be one. We don't want to assign three quarters to B because somehow now I'm adjusting the value of B downwards because of something that happened in the past, right? Um, and that's typically, right, kind of, it, it seems counterintuitive, let's say. Um, so uh, for that reason, we say, okay, uh, this uh, minimizing the mean squared TD error, that's probably not what we really want, right? And that's also why saying, oh, we have this semi-gradient uh, method uh, which looks like it's a gradient of the TD error, let's make it a true gradient of the TD error, why that's not really what we want to do, because then we would find that solution where B is 0 0.75. Okay, so what instead we could do is minimize the mean squared Bellman error, right? So in that case, um, the I could assign 1 to B, and I could assign 0 to C, and now we can look at what's the Bellman error and still have 0 0.5 at A for the same argument as before. And I could say, what's the Bellman error at A? So now I have to take the average of the TD error if I end up this transition and the TD error if I end up this transition. So right with this transition, I have a TD error of uh, uh, negative one. And this transition, I have a TD error of positive one. So the Bellman error is just the average of these two. So the average of positive one and negative one is zero, of course, right? So if I look at the, what's the mean square Bellman error of that particular assignment of values, the Bellman error is going to be zero, right? So uh, th that gives me a solution concept that I'm really happy with. It agrees with maybe the values that I would assign intuitively. Um, Okay, so now we have something that we say, okay, that's really desirable. And then we can think of like, can we actually reach it, right? Can we define an algorithm that actually finds those type of solutions? And there actually we can prove that we cannot do that. Because I can have two different environments that generate exactly the same data, yet they have different solutions for the uh, mean square Bellman error. So if I have any type of algorithm that takes data and spits out a uh, value function, I cannot put a box there that is happy for both of these two environments, right? Because yeah, the data will be the same. I'm gonna spit out the same value function. And at most one of these two environments, I'm gonna be correct. The other one, I'm going to be wrong, right? Um, so um, the minimization of the, mean, of the mean square Bellman error is not possible for data. You need to have access to the underlying MDP. You cannot do it from data alone. If you want to see what this counterexample actually is, also it's in the in the in the Sato and Barto book. All right. So um, now for bootstrapping, basically this projected Bellman error is the only f one left, right? We have seen that this one is not really desirable. This one is not um, achievable. This minimum value error is also, right, this is something that's not based on TD errors. This is something that's based on Monte Carlo errors. So that's not something we can get through bootstrapping. So the only thing that we have left is um, this projected bell, uh, the minimum of the projected Bellman error. And actually, now it's maybe starting to look um, <laughs> quite appealing, right? So we already know that if, if semi-gradient descent converges, it converges to that one. Right, so it's kind of maybe something that we say, oh, actually, it kind of maybe already makes sense. Um, and we know that if we have linear approximation, uh, that the projected Bellman error is zero at that point. So, I mean, that's maybe also, also nice. Um, so, okay, so now we can say, okay, we can already find that if we are on policy and if we have linear function approximation, then um, a semi-gradient descent finds that. Semi-gradient TD. Now, we can think of, okay, can we also, can we now find an algorithm that's maybe a little bit more stable, that's based on a bit more, let's say, directly based on trying to find that point, um, and which also works in the off-policy setting, okay? So I don't want to go through all mathematical derivations because of, of the time, 
um, uh, again, right? This is all in the in the Sato Abarto book. Um, but right, you can show through kind of a, a sequence of steps that I can actually define a true gradient algorithm that starts with this loss function of the mean square projected Bellman error, and tries to and 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 uh, finds this equality for the gradient of that error. So. Well, for this gradient of error, we get like this product of three factors that are all based on expectations. If we have a single expectation, we can always get a pretty good uh, um, estimate of that expectation by just plugging in samples and averaging it, right? In this case, we cannot just do that because the first factor and the last factor both depend on this random variable that that's kind of uh, uh, not uh, calculatable, let's say, not uh, not a deterministic function of xt. Um, and yeah, maybe for some of you that's uh, intuitive why that means you cannot just plug in samples. Maybe it's not for everyone, so I kind of made a small example to like illustrate that. Um, okay, ignore that. Um, so why is that a problem? So for example, co consider this very simple example. Consider I just have a random variable y which is a uniform distribution over minus one and uh, negative one and positive one. Um, and let's say I want to um, find, uh, estimate this term, right? Expectation of y times expectation of y, right? So, well, what's the expect expected value of y? And y is either negative one or positive one, so its expectation is zero, right? So expectation of y times expectation of y will be zero. Um, what happens if we just take this equation and just plug in samples from the system, right? So we're going to take this expression, y times y, and just plug in samples. Either I'm going to put a negative one, I get negative one times negative one, I'm going to get positive one. It should be an average, sorry, not a sum, but it doesn't matter in this case. So I'm going to get positive one. If I now have a sample with which is the positive one, uh, put the positive one, I get positive one times positive one is also one, right? So if I average these together, I get out positive one. And actually, so it's not the same, right? So that's actually the, the first thing to uh, uh, to realize. So actually, what we're approximating, approximating in this way, it's not expected value of y times expected value of y. Actually, what we're approximating is the expectation expected value of y square. That's of course not the same as this guy over here, right? So what we can't do is just take our transitions and plug the um, values of the transitions in this long um, expression and hope to get a unbiased estimate of this gradient that we're looking for. Um, but we can define another algorithm. So for example, one algorithm, again, that's, uh, that's also discussed in the book, is uh, we can look at this whole bit together as a um, intermediate value, and we call it v, and we'll learn v from data. So this is going to be based on like kind of a longer uh, sequence of um, data from the system, and then with a new, um, whenever a new transition comes in, uh, we look at that learned value of v. And then we just plug, I and then we just plug the um, reward and 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 uh, features of the current state, features of the next state, and so on. We just plug it in for this first uh, factor. Um, and so there is a uh, right. We can define a kind of elegant algorithm to kind of approximate this whole bit. So if you look at this bit, it looks a little bit like the. Um, uh, formulation of the least square problem, right? If I have like input features x and output features uh, uh, delta. So actually this just looks like a kind of an incremental implementation of a um, um, of a least square problem. So we have an update equation for v, and then we have an update equation for, for the overall w that's approximating the, the value function. Now we have two learning rates. We need some, there is some technical uh, um, conditions on the on the uh, values of uh, beta and alpha okay um, yeah so what we have now is an algorithm right? so we said actually what the semi gradient method is doing if we're on policy is minimize this projected Bellman error right now we say okay let's then just start out from the point of view of we have that projected Bellman error and we want to find its gradient its true gradient um, 
and then we kind of find as one of the possible solutions is this particular algorithm to minimize that error, which is now, because it's a true gradient method, it's much more robust. It also works in the off policy setting if you add in uh, the required, um, oh, it's already there, right? There, the, the importance weight. Okay, so this algorithm is called uh, GTD2, so it's called gradient TD, uh, and well, right, there's different methods based on the gradient TD concept. So GTD2 is just this particular method. There's also other methods based on the same, let's say, principle. Um, and what this does, uh, it can be proven to converge to zero mean squared projected Bellman error if you have linear features. If you have nonlinear uh, approximation, this still converges, so that's the good news, but you're gonna get a local optimum, right? Which is, I mean, in general, if you have nonlinear uh, approximation, that's all you can hope for anyway. Um, and this is not the, let's say, the be-all and end-all. There are more sophisticated gradient TD methods, but I won't be able to, to cover them today. Um, you can also wonder, okay, what do we now pay, right? What do we pay for having this kind of fancy method? Um, well, we have to, with an extra tuning parameter, so we, rather than just setting the step size for W, this alpha, oops, this alpha over here, we now also need to set the step size for V. So we get, right, we get, uh, again, more tuning variables, so like as if we didn't already have enough, let's say, right? Um, and of course we need to store and update two parameter factors, right? So we get uh, twice the memory requirement and kind of times the com compute requirement of basically whatever uh, 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 um, algorithm we had, um, which is, I mean, I guess it's like non-trivial, but it also doesn't seem like excessive, I guess. Um, so I guess now we can think about, uh, okay, can we somehow uh, think about all of this a little bit in the bigger picture, right? So there was a lot of details, but now can we kind of summarize what are these different algorithms that we have and right, which of them are actually uh, uh, converging, not converging, what do we actually converge to and so on. So to kind of, um, let's say, capture that overall view, um, I have make this table uh, where I put the different methods we have looked at here. So we had semi-gradient TD. We also had LSTD, which you very quickly covered like in one slide, right? We were thinking about what the semi-gradient TD converged to. And then we had uh, gradient TD, right? So this GTD2 algorithm uh, as an example of it, where we just covered in the last slide. Um, so the first thing I can note is that, right, we saw in the example that semi-gradient TD doesn't necessarily converge um, if we are off policy setting, right? So I already wrote there, it, there's no convergence, right? Um, if we are nonlinear, I didn't, we didn't really talk about that, but if we have nonlinear uh, function approximation, um, semi-gradient TD also doesn't necessarily converge. So, right, in these two cases, you might also potentially have problems. LSTD is by its nature, right, it's least squares TD, it's by its nature a linear method. So we can't do anything if we're not linear. Right, so I can already kind of write that down. So now we have, what do we have left? Uh, yeah, about 10 uh, ca different cases left. Um, and they are actually very simple. So everywhere else on the table, they are gonna converge to the minimum of the uh, projected Bellman error, right? So there are some conditions. So I try to summarize the most important uh, ones of them. So of course, if we have a gradient method, we need to take an appropriate step size schedule, right? So you always need to have these um, yeah, step sizes that decrease over time in a particular way to guarantee convergence to the, to the optimum. Um, for li linear function approximation, if your features are independent, there's a single solution, so you always converge to the same point. If your functions are not independent, um, there are multiple optimal solutions. So you're gonna converge to one of them. It's always gonna be op an optimum, but there's gonna be multiple optima, and depending on how you initialize, right, sometimes you might find one, and sometimes you might find another, um, which is probably fine, but it's good to know. Um, if you're in the tabular case, whether it's on or off policy, um, right, we know that uh, we find the optimal solution. So the point where the Projected Bellman error is minimum is also the real optimal value function. Everywhere else we're approximating, so uh, the point of the minimum projected Bellman error is not necessarily the uh, true value function because maybe the true value function is not representable in our 
subspace. Okay, um, then we can wonder about, right, in which cases do we have a global convergence? So where do we find the global optimum? And that's also uh, kind of easy. It's wherever we have linear approximation, we find the uh, uh, global optimum of this projected Bellman error. And whenever we have a nonlinear function approximation, we might find a local optimum. Questions so far? All right. Um, I see we're running out of time, but let me quickly uh, wrap up to make a little bridge to uh, Vincent's lecture after the break. Um, so, right, Vincent uh, will uh, talk about um, uh, DQN, so the famous algorithm for learning to play Atari games, and this illustrates some of the challenges in doing control with function approximation or also with nonlinear function approximation, right? Um, and, um, well, I don't want to go into the details here because that's what uh, Vincent is going to do. Um, but um, to make the bridge to what we have covered um, in my lecture um, is that, well, we've looked mostly at linear function approximation. And this linear function approximation has nice properties, but you need to task specific features to, to, to design them, right? Um, if you plug in a deep neural network uh, in there instead, you can feed it like very raw information, like the raw pixels from your screen or something like this, right? And you could think of the neural network as kind of learning its own features, let's say, right? Um, and, uh, well, Vincent will go into all the details to like how that is exactly implemented. Um, but I think what's important for this tutorial is to realize that this DQN um, learns off policy, so kind of right, you're in this dangerous territory, with a semi-gradient version of Q-learning. So this is very roughly uh, uh, the update on which DQN is based. So you see, right, just as we have seen today, we have a target that actually also depends on W, which doesn't show up in this, um, this part of the gradient. And what we've learned today is that semi-gradient learning used off policy is potentially uh, unstable. And so one of the things that they do in uh, DQN to actually stabilize that is that they don't plug in this W here, but they maintain a kind of a copy of the parameters that's updated at a slower rate. So it doesn't, kind of you break a little bit that dependency. And uh, this uh, copy of the parameters is used in the target. So now this actually becomes more like, a, like let's say, a kind of true gradient method. Now, this is not the only thing that uh, that they did to actually make this work. So, uh, Vincent will discuss all of this in, in more detail. Yeah, with that, I want to wrap up. Um, so, I guess we have seen that on-policy control with function approximation is relatively straightforward. But as soon as you go off-policy, whether you do prediction or control, um, it gets quite tricky quite fast. Um, and we have seen that one solution is to use this gradient TD algorithm, a bit more complex algorithm, but it follows a true gradient. Um, and as overhead, you have to keep track of more values and you have an additional hyperparameter. Um, this, no, okay, I didn't, this is actually not correct what I wrote. Uh, I wrote down it only works for linear uh, function approximation. That's not really true. Um, but um, I mean, this is made mostly for, let's say, relatively modest systems. Let's uh, let's put it like this. So, um, of course, what DQN does is looking at this massive neural network, right? So um, that's, I guess, very hard to analyze uh, analytically and to really guarantee convergence, but they do demonstrate kind of empirically that it just works really well, right, on the Atari games and, and, and so on. Um, so, uh, um, and, and for that, they uh, use essentially additional let's say more or less heuristic mechanisms to keep learning stable. Um, so, uh, yeah, the power of that is that it uh, um, um, yeah, works really well empirically and without having to manually uh, design task specific features. With that, um, I guess we should defer questions to the break since I'm a little bit over time, if there's anything else. Yeah, thanks. Any last minute question? Okay, so I think we can go on the on break and come back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Helge.